morning by morning grants us new mercies. For great is God's faithfulness, and all we have needed, the Lord's hands have provided. Amen. 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 Will you pray with me? Summer and winter, springtime and autumn. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercies, and love. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. Holy One, we thank you indeed for the new mercy of this another day. As we reflect on this October and breast cancer awareness, we pray that those who are living with cancer would indeed experience your mercy on this day. In this month where we think of those who are dealing with domestic violence, we pray your mercy as well. We thank you that you have given us mercy and humble us enough to share and to give that mercy. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. To Reverend Gloria Cox and her organizational prowess, and the skills and the giftedness that she bears. Thank you for all that you've done to make this day possible and to have me here in this place. To Asha and Riley, our co-liturgists for today. And to all who are gathered in God's place on this beautiful autumn morning. I bring you greetings from the Chicago Theological Seminary and before I go any further, I want to acknowledge some of the finest trustees, not just in Chicago, but perhaps in the world. I want to acknowledge Janet McLean, although she told me last night she would not be here, but I'm grateful for her leadership and for her presence and her service on our board. I honor her sister, attorney Susan McLean, who is here. And I'm grateful for our Susan's leadership as well. We were all together no less than, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours ago at an event in the pouring rain. But what a wonderful occasion it was indeed as we celebrated our Muslim brothers and sisters. I also want to acknowledge one of our newest trustees, Ms. Audrey Williams, who is sitting back there. So grateful for her and her presence and want to welcome her to CTS as well. So I think I have dotted all of my official eyes, and I have crossed my, those who are in, demand, in command, T's. And so now hear the word of the Lord. The message version says, Jesus commented, the tax man, not the other, went home and made, was made right with God. Jesus commented, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough. If you need me, call me, no matter where you are, no matter how far. Just call my name. I'll be there in a hurry. You don't have to worry. Because, baby, there ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you. No, you won't find this in any hymnal. I doubt the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or any Christian choral ensemble sings this on a Sunday morning. I offer you this Motown hit. Can't you hear Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell just singing it? I give this because Luke likes to play with geography. The author engages plains, mountains, trees, cities, and towns to 
teach us about faith, mission, worship, temptation, and humility. The Sermon on the Mount, the road to Emmaus, Zacchaeus up a tree, a stressed out Jesus on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Transfiguration, all are ways in which Luke uses the land to teach us about what it means to live in the Lord. No mountain high enough, no valley low enough, no river wide enough to keep us from getting to Jesus. This literary move with geographical flavor often has theological tenets, physical highs, mountains, lows of the plains, up a tree, seeds thrown down on the ground, or Luke marries geography with theology through the framework of sociology and social status. And whereas there are no pronounced land, air, or sea references in this morning's passage, Luke still toys with what it means to be high and low, up and down. For we travel up to the temple to learn what it means when we are too uppity and dare to look down on someone else. No mountain too high, no valley so low. In our passage, Luke records two persons traveling up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee is a member of the Jewish religious group, and they are responsible for upholding the Torah. The Pharisees ensured that the people upheld the law as given to Moses. Their task was to hold people accountable, to connect what thus saith Adonai to the way in which people must live. They were to merge Israel's history with its presence in order to ensure its future would be fruitful. On the contrary, there is the tax collector. They were shysters. Mendacity was their name. Cupidity was their game. Stealing was their meal, and they washed it down with lying. Whereas Pharisees represented Jewish culture, tax collectors were emblematic of Roman imperialism and domination. And Luke presents both the macrocosm, the larger world, and the microcosm, the smaller world, in these five verses. The tax collector is the social antithesis and the literary foil of the Pharisee. The tension is palpable. And just as profound is their response to themselves, and yes, their view of each other. And we may want to give the Pharisee a bad rap, but yeah, we'll get to that. But first, let me say, this is not a case of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. I aver that Luke's point is about you and me. It's about us. Yes, this is us. First, the Pharisee went to the temple to pray, according to verse 10. He offers gratitude. Verse 11 says, he says, God, I thank you. He went to the holy place, and once there, he acknowledges the Holy One. Give him a cookie for that. Before expounding on his own goodness and glory, he renders gratitude. He pauses if for only a moment to show appreciation. And through all of his knowledge of the law of Moses, those causeistic and apodictic laws, the Pharisee has reverence enough to go to the temple to pray. He has the wherewithal to give thanks. And on this Higher Education Sunday, I think Luke shows us that no matter how much we know that we know that we know, we ought to find ourselves in church, in the holy place. We ought to find ourselves in the sacred gathering, praying and giving thanks. That our academic matriculation goes hand in hand with our educational prowess. That our theological maturation goes hand in hand with spiritual practice. 
Yes, the Pharisee goes to the temple to pray. And once in the temple, he begins his prayer with thanksgiving. And it gets a little peculiar after that. According to Luke in verses 11b and 12, the Pharisee does what, well, what we sometimes do. He engages in sociological negation for the sake of spiritual elevation. Valley low, mountain high. He pits himself against another human being. He juxtaposes his unrealized, jacked up life with somebody else's junk. He postures his status over someone else's position. Listen to what he says. I'm not a thief. I'm not a rogue. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even a tax collector. I'm not like those on the other side of the travel van. I'm not like those in detention centers. I'm not like those trying to cross our border and hurt our children and rape our women. I'm not like those who come from defecation holes. I'm not like one of them who's too lazy to work and doesn't deserve federal aid. I'm not like one of them who doesn't deserve disaster relief. I, I'm not like them. I give my 10% willingly or sometimes with an attitude. I fast twice a week, but yet I'm really counting down when the fast is going to be over. Then our activism, we have to be careful that we're not subliminally saying, I'm not one of them. When we pray with our prayers and pray with our feet and protest with our prayers, we have to make sure that our blind spot of entitlement doesn't show up. That we're not saying, I'm glad it's not me, that yes, I'm marching with them and standing with them and protesting with them, but all we say to ourselves, I'm glad it's them and not me. So we have to be careful what we say that we are not. We, like the Pharisee, ought to proceed with caution in not checking certain boxes. For in stating what we are not, are we by default declaring what we are? Are we characterizing and putting ourselves in unseemly spaces? Notice the Pharisee didn't say he wasn't a murderer. He didn't say he wasn't a seditionist. He didn't say he wasn't a molester. He didn't say he wasn't sexist or racist or homophobic or xenophobic. We have to walk easy when we engage in character comparison and social analogies and spiritual juxtapositioning. For Pilgrim, our mark is the Lord most high. Our measure is the maker of heaven and earth. Our plumb line is the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent one. Why look at the splinter in my eye when there's a tree log in your eye? The Pharisee's interpretive lens was wrong. His gaze was out of alignment. And yet in the passage, it took a crook to show us a better way. Now, I'm not purporting criminality, cheating, or cupidity by any means. But let's not discount Luke's literary gravitas. It, as this gospel moves from Jerusalem to the Gentile world, it demonstrates for us a geographical shift, but also it demonstrates racial and ethnic reorientation. For in Luke's community, the Gentiles are also on the receiving end. A tax collector who is deemed dishonest and untrustworthy teaches us about having a healthy self-perception. A shady character gives handles on handling narcissism. And Lord knows we need help with the current narcissist in chief. Notice Luke's record in verse 13. The tax collector 
the IRS in the 20th of the first century goes to the temple to pray mountain high. And the message version says that the tax collector puts his face in his hands, doesn't dare to look up valley low, beats his chest, stands a far off river wide enough so that his verbal expression mirrors his bodily exhibition. He announces, I'm a sinner. I'm not more spiritual. I'm not any more holy than anyone else. The tax collector says he has missed the mark, not calling anyone stupid or a loser. He has suffered a race that he has not hit the target. Have mercy, for I am a sinner. And Luke uses this pericope in chapter 18 to foreshadow the story of Zacchaeus in chapter 19. Notice here and there that they are both tax collectors. Both self-identify as sinners. In the Greek, the word is ha-amatolos. It just means someone who has missed the mark. It's the same word used back in chapter 7 in Luke. Here it describes a woman who washes the feet of Jesus with her hair. She too is at a mark loss, someone who has missed the mark. But notice, for some reason, the woman's sin is sexual sin, but the male sin, not so much. That's a sermon for another day. <laughs> Nonetheless, I digress. The tax collector teaches us how to approach the throne of grace. He demonstrates how to look at ourselves and how to look at each other. Through body language, the tax collector models how to examine our own existential reality. A tax collector, someone deemed to be an outsider, questionable. You'd give him the side eye, if you will. Didn't expect much from a tax collector. A tax collector teaches us about self-perspective. Never discount the source of a life lesson. The 1960s, it was garbage men, sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, who walked around saying, I am a man. It was Sojourn in Truth, a former slave, who asked the question, ain't I a woman? Harriet Tubman, a former slave, said, you want to go back, you die. But if you go forward, you live. It was a black gay man, Bayard Rustin, who was the principal strategist of the March on Washington. It was a small, framed Catholic nun, Mother Teresa, who taught us that the poor deserve our best. It was a frail man from India named Gandhi, who taught us that we could conquer more with nonviolence than with raising our fists. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Swern of Iowa, Louisa. These were people who taught us what it means that we can't discount the source of a life lesson. And on this Higher Education Sunday, we must know that education comes from all people, of all races, gender identities, class, ableism, and yes, we honor book sense in my own discipline. We, we honor Niebuhr and Tillich. Yes, we think of Steinem and Caddy Staten and Cohn and Asasi Diaz and Gonzalez and yes, Plato and Aristotle and Augustin. And yet still there is something about the common sense of mothers of the movement. There is something about the knowledge that came from Big Mom and that knowledge that came from our neighbors? What about the wisdom that we gain from those who cook in the cafeteria? What about the street cred and the street wisdom that we've gained? What's the information we gain from those who clean our offices? And yes, we think of all the Harvards and Howards and Yales and Elmhurst and U of C's and Charlotte's and all of the other higher education institutions. But what about all the 
knowledge we gain just sitting at the table, just sitting at the kitchen, just sitting on the couch. We must make sure that in all our learning, we maintain a pulse on everyday people around us. You do know that hashtag Me Too and hashtag Black Lives Matter, they weren't born in the ivory towers, but they came through the loins of people on the ground. There are folk in our biosphere who will never get to the ivory towers, but they will invest in our talents. They will invest socially and intellectually. There were folk who will never get to the hollow halls of academia, but they will journey with us. They will hold us accountable for the work that we are called to do. A tax collector standing between Roman imperialism and Jewish oppression and Gentile subjugation teaches us what it means not to think too highly of ourselves. So on this Higher Education Sunday, I mean, is there a thing called Lower Education? <laughs> I know on Higher Education Sunday, why would you not think high of yourself? Well, the reason is very clear. The passage says everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The message version says, you walk around with your nose in the air, probably fall on your face. But if you're content just to sit and be yourself wildly in Austin, you'll become more than yourself. And I know as women, we have to be careful because sexism attempts to coerce us to humbling ourselves. As people of color, racism doesn't need another excuse to otherize our existence. As members of the LGBTQIA, we don't need to give heteronormativity another pass. We don't need to give the isms another reason to dismiss our reality and discount our relevance. In a world where hubris reigns at 1600 Transylvania Avenue, you'll get that over lunch. <laughs> the idea of humbling ourselves seems far-fetched, but the point is to judge ourselves by ourselves, to examine and to be honest with ourselves for ourselves, Pilgrim, to examine your own life according to your life. Nah, to examine who we are based on the one who made us. To look at our life alongside the giver of all life. Ain't no mountain high enough to keep us from looking at the one who is able to move mountains. No valley low enough to keep us from looking at the lily of the valley. Ain't no river wide enough to preclude us from getting to the one who can walk on water. The spiritual says, so high, can't get over. So low, can't get under. So wide, can't go around. There's a verse that says, though we reach the highest heaven, holding worlds at your command, we are yet a desert people, searching for the promised land. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, Leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey, now and ever, evermore. And in case Marvin Gaye and Motown don't work for you, my grandmother used to put it this way. The blood that Jesus shed for me, way back on Calvary, it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the low in this valley, the blood that gives me strength, that gives us strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. God bless you today.